Welcome Dr. L. Carol Scott to the Midlife Makeover Show. We are so happy you are here. Oh my gosh. Tell us a little bit about what you do and why you do it. Hi, Wendy. I am delighted to be here. Um, I like to help people get along better on the adult playgrounds where they play now. But I use tools from when they were little and playing on the little playgrounds with little kids and really playing. But that's how we learn all of our social and emotional patterns for good relationships or not. Um, are all of our uh, maladaptive and manipulative patterns where relationships grow there too. So I like to help people sort that out and mm. become an adult that everyone is delighted to have as a friend, as a coworker, as a sibling, um, to become people who, for whom relationship isn't just a thing we do, but it's like the only thing that we think is important. Oh, I love that. It's so funny. It's, I love that term about um, on the playground, like, because it, I mean, like it, it brought me back and it made me think about how I was on the playground, how I'm at the right? playground now, how I was with other kids and how I'm, I, I am with adults now. It's so fascinating. That's such a perfect way to put it. Well, and aren't we all always just trying to get some stuff done, right? We're trying right. to make ourselves happy. We're trying to protect what's ours. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to get more of what we want. We're trying to build alliances. I think the important thing for us to know, particularly at midlife, and by the way, I would love to know when that actually started for me. I think it's yeah. been going on a while now. I keep extending it. <laughs> I know. Um, I think they, they technically say now it's up to 70. I'm like, okay. Okay, good, good. I'm still in my midlife. I'm still in my midlife. Yeah. But I think, you know, what we have to look at is um, the, the crucial role that important relationships, and by that, I mean, beyond your spouse, but all the important relationships in your life, what they actually mean to you in terms of their value for mm. your, your ability to get stuff done that you want to yeah. get done. And what you're trying to get done, the things you want, the things, um, the ways in which you're trying to um, get along with other people, they have changed a little bit over time, but right. at their essence, they are the same. And so I teach what I call the SAS, seven self-aware success strategies, S-A-S-S, -S -S, self-aware success strategies, seven of them that we were supposed to, they were really a birthright for us from birth to seven years oh, of cool. age, like kind of one per year. We were maturing into these opportunities for social and emotional competence or emotional intelligence, social intelligence, getting along with people in the healthy ways so that we don't have to be codependent, manipulate them, bully them, um, be passive aggressive, you know, all the, the tools that we adopt, the strategies that we adopt right. to get along on the playground that really, you know, they're cute maybe when you're seven, but they're not that cute when you're 35. <laughs> Yeah, it's so perfect. Yeah. Well, the thing is too, I was just, as you were talking, I was thinking about with relationships. Yeah. Like when you, when you're a child, when you become, when you're a teenager, you just, you don't really, you're saying about how to putting the value on those relationships and what they mean to you. And that, you know, and each one is different. And then yeah. I feel like for a lot of us, we kind of just fall into relationship whatever it is, you know, whether if it's our sibling or friends or intimate relationships where you just kind of like go into it, not really going in with like, what does this mean to me? Right. Right. And so I think it's, that's really interesting to think about it that way. And when I think about midlifers and people, you know, they're reaching midlife and they're in all these relationships and probably take a step back and go, why am I in this relationship? <laughs> you know, like, what does this relationship mean to me? Do I want to keep this relationship? And, and maybe like you said too, it's like, you do kind of, you have to kind of go back of like who, who you are at your core, what you've been taught, yes. what you want to, un, you, you know, unlearn, you know, Yes. Yeah. And, it, and in fact, even uh, more deeply, this, this work is deep and I, by yeah. that I mean it's deep within us. And so not only is it things we've learned, but it's things that were literally wired into our neural system when we were birth to five. You yes. 
95% of your brain was wired between when you were born and when you were five. Mm. And 85% of it was wired before you were three. Wow. Almost all of that brain wiring is about your social and emotional competence. You learn how to get along with other people from birth to three, and you don't even know what's going on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're just waiting for your next meal and (laughs) (laughs) trying to to understand trying to understand the dynamics of your own body and how it works and how to move around in the world and interact with all these other beings that are of different sizes and everybody's got their own stuff they want and you got your stuff you want and you don't know how to talk yet I mean it's like it's this very complicated developmental period although if we really you know if everyone who raised a toddler and an infant understood what was going on oh my god the world would be such a different place yeah yeah well and I was just thinking too, it's like you, you, at that time in your life, you really don't have a choice. You're just kind of like, okay. And now you do have a choice. Right. Right. So I think it's, so how, so tell me more about the SAS. I'm, I'm, I'm curious about those seven yeah. principles and. Yeah. So, so I'm, my life is as a developmental psychologist, I work with mm-hmm. young kids and their families from birth to seven mm-hmm. years of age. That's my wheelhouse. Wow. And during my career, when I was working on my doctorate in developmental mm-hmm. psychology, I went to therapy for my own childhood mm. and uh, realized that there were some things that I was missing as an adult that would be quite helpful to have, like the capacity to trust other people, to feel like it was a safe place to mm-hmm. be the world and that other people are there for me, right. that there's sort of this they got my back sense, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I learned in in my child development studies is that I should have gotten that sense like in my first six months of life. That's a developmental Mm -hmm. uh, aspect. That's an aspect of development. It's it's literally like part of the programming is that you're going to have, and, and the way I think of it now is that infants have one strategy to use. They only have one, and that's to trust that we're going to take care of them. Right. Because we're the most dependent species on the planet. We cannot take care of ourselves after birth like at all. Right. So we have to trust. And so it makes sense that trust is a fundamental component of our social makeup then as adults. Mm-hmm. And so I started looking at what are the things my little kids in my preschools, in the families I work with, what are they developing in terms of social and emotional competencies? What do I see in them? Um, do I have that in myself? And my therapist really fostered that saying, look at the teachers in the classroom. You have a room full of little kids who are showing you what to do. Right. And so here are, here are the seven trust, which is a strategy from infancy. Mm-hmm. The strategy from our toddler year, I call independence. Mm. And if you've ever met a toddler, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> independence being who you are. Mm-hmm. Third at three is faith, which is Believing in all things, believing in the impossible, believing in possibility, mm. or more broadly defined than you can imagine now as an adult. Yeah. At four, that all seems a little fun and a little bit too fluffy, and they want to learn the rules. So it's all mm. about negotiation, negotiating to get what you want. Two is knowing what you want. Four is negotiating to get it. And then at five, kids start to be really social in groups. And so I call their success strategy vision, but it isn't just about having their own goal or dream vision in their mind for themselves. It's about Mm -hmm. creating group harmony around a goal and getting Mm -hmm. everybody working on it together. My example that everybody recognizes in a five-year-old is a group of five-year-olds planning what to play planning how to play, who's going to do what, when, who's going to take what role, sometimes even down to the scripted words. And then you're going to say, because it's part of what they have to say, you know, in order to be Luke Skywalker or Darth Vader, whoever they're being. Right. And then, so that ability to kind of capture the group and enroll them in a vision and get Mm -hmm. them all working together um, needs to be uh, polished at six with the ability to compromise because it isn't always going to go exactly the way you see it. Right. And then um, that sort of values led approach to interaction. If you have to compromise, you have to give up some of what you want. Well, what's more important to you? Mm -hmm. What do you really want versus what could you let go of? That's a values driven decision or it should be. Mm -hmm. And then that takes us into the value place of accepting how things are. 
accepting mm-hmm. that sometimes you do get what you want. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes somebody else is going to take the lead. Sometimes you are. Sometimes really good things happen to really like bad people. Mm-hmm. Sometimes really bad things happen to really good people. And that can include you. Right. You can have a really bad something happen in your life, an event, a circumstance in your life. Even if you follow all the rules as a kid and do your homework and be, you know, go to church and be be the person that your parents tell you you're supposed to be. And then one of your parents can get really sick or get really injured or Mm -hmm. somebody you love can die. I mean, really, really bad things can happen. Mm -hmm. And so acceptance is sort of the end of the social and emotional competence road of the success strategies. So trust, independence, faith, negotiation, vision, compromise, and acceptance. And if we have the ability to do those seven things, and it's kind of their big things, they're like pockets full of things. Yeah, I was going to say, those are like That's not, those aren't simple statements. But if we have those kinds of emotional capacities and, and intelligences in our social relationships, we have great relationships. They're full of joy. They're full of productivity. They bring us growth and opportunity and um, transformation. Mm -hmm. And they don't drag us down. They don't keep us constantly in struggle. Right. Yeah. And I I was just thinking about, well, not not that I was just thinking about myself, but (laughs) as you were like, I feel like, you know, like those words that you were, those, those seven, as you were saying each word, it's like, there's a couple of them that were really like, you know, like the ones that scare you the most are the ones that, you know, you you need to work on the most. And, and same for me too. I went through a lot of therapy to deal with things, you know, from the past. And my biggest fear in relationship is abandonment. And that goes back from 40 plus, yeah, 40 years ago. So so how do you, okay. So if I come to you, I'm like, oh my gosh, like I love, and I, it's, it's interesting because like I love relationships. I really do. And then there's, there's, there's this kind of like tug of war with it. Mm-hmm. And where I'm like, there's these fears though, that bubble up. And, and I know now, like I have this awareness about it now. I'm like, oh, here it is. Oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you, how do you get to that point where you can overcome like is it possible to overcome like okay I no longer fear being abandoned and I, and I can feel comfortable and safe I believe yes that mm. is something that can be overcome I do and it starts with you said the word awareness you become yeah. aware of yourself you become aware of a pattern you become aware of a feeling you become aware of who you are from a sort of back the camera up perspective you're looking at yourself looking at yourself kind of yes yes so once you go there then i think it's about looking i start people with what i call development do-overs which ask you to look at your behavior patterns Mm -hmm. what do you do right now relative to abandonment how does that occur for you in your life Mm -hmm. and what is you know we're going to look at the flip side of that so abandonment means you don't trust people to be there for you right So let's take a look at what you can trust people for. Mm -hmm. So what are the things you need from other people besides being there for you? Mm -hmm. How do you define that? What does that look like in little bits? If somebody's there for you, how do you know it? What are they doing? Right, right. Right. Get specific, get clear about your understanding of what it means to not be abandoned, to trust Mm -hmm. that someone is there for you. And then look around at your world, at the people in your world and ask yourself, who does that? Who mm-hmm. does this thing that I have just said is being there for me? Mm. Who can I count on? You know, they get to have a bad day now and then, but 85, 90% of the time, if that's what I need, I, I can get that right there right. from that right. one person. Then looking at the flip side of that coin, specific need, this, this way of someone being there for me, listening to me when I talk without interrupting me, maybe that's part of your definition. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you put that in as this is the thing I need. And uh, Josefina over here gives me that. She listens to me so great. Yeah. Who is somebody that I know is really crummy at that? (laughs) Who in my (laughs) life, who I love dearly for other reasons, clearly, just doesn't do that at all. And so it's like a little uh, exercise in building your universe around your needs. And Mm -hmm. then we look for the patterns, the behavior patterns, your behavior patterns. Mm. So, okay, now you know who's the, who's the yes and who's the no on this need. Who are you going to? Mm -hmm. Who are you trying to get 
to listen to you? Are you going to Josefina every time you need somebody to listen to you? Right. Are you going over here to Roger who just can't even? <laughs> yeah, I just can't. He's not, Roger's not. And no judgment. Him. It's like a no judgment. No, right? Right. Uh, like right. they're not good at that. Right. And it doesn't mean they're a bad person. And it might, they might be there for you for other needs you have. They might mm -hmm. be the one like Josephina is for listening without interrupting. They might be the person who really does great something else that you need. So, and it does that kind of, yeah. And I was just thinking too, is that kind of go into the acceptance part of it? That Roger's Roger, Josephine's Josephine. Bingo. Bingo. Yes. Yeah. And that's part of also the strategy of independence, gaining our own independence as a person and knowing we're over here being uniquely who we are. Ain't nobody. Right else wendy valentine right right ain't nobody else carol scott and thank god for that <laughs> i'm a lot yeah <laughs> me too <laughs> right and so is everybody so yes. each of us came through this wiring of our brain process uh oh sorry i thought i turned oh that's that okay i know me too i thought I like, oh I thought i turned all those noisemakers off <laughs> that's okay um, but every one of us comes through this dance of interaction because the way your brain wires up is in response to your interaction with the environment, the people and the mm -hmm. objects in your environment wire your brain by how you have the opportunity to interact with them. So if we go from extremes, mm -hmm. uh, we go from the kid who's locked in a closet and has nobody to talk to for hours on end and is neglected and treated badly all the way to a kid who's you know, every moment is um, connected to, whose mm -hmm. every uh, effort to express who they are is seen and heard and responded to in some way. I see you, you know, with some mm -hmm. message that says, I see you. Those two kids grow up with very, very different behavior patterns around relationships, of course. Right. And those are two things are at the far end of a very long continuum of variations on the theme. Therefore, any group of people I'm in, every single person in there, I have to assume is a unique individual who is really, you know, very little like me. We might mm -hmm. find things we have in common. And of course we will. Mm -hmm. And we will find things to talk about. And they will forever be a mystery to me and I will forever be a mystery to them. Yeah. For a really long time, at least. Got to be with somebody a long time before they stop being a mystery. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So fascinating. So in the same way, you can, you, you can overcome the fear of abandonment. And I've done a lot of like, I've always been fascinated with neuroplasticity and rewiring of the brain. So how do you end up like literally like getting in there to go, okay, let's change our thinking here, our emotions, and how we can play better on the playground? Um, great question again. And uh, it really does start, I think, with behavior is one way, one doorway in. So I start with the doorway of behavior. And for some of us, and I include myself in this, the doorway needs to open to a deeper place uh, beyond that. So I can start by repatterning my behavior, being self-aware, noticing what I do. Changing my behavior changes my thinking, and that changes my emotional life. And my brain got why Now, I'm a person who grew up in a family full of trauma. So my brain is wired around a lot of really bad stuff yep. and it needs to have direct intervention. Somebody needs to get in there with a screwdriver. And yeah. so <laughs> the level of applied neurology, EFT tapping, EMDR work with the therapist directly intervening in the neural network is mm -hmm. another possibility that goes beyond what I do because not everybody needs that. Some people can just change their behavior and that's enough. Right. And it, I think it depends on I hate to say it this way, but like level of damage, level of, of yep. impact from those environmental wiring circumstances. Right. So uh, should we talk about the ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences? Yes. Yeah. I think those are important for us to know when we get to the middle of our lives and we're working with human beings that we finally are seeing as multidimensional, I think maybe some mm -hmm. of us for the first time is to recognize that Adver certain adverse childhood experiences create a, a person who really um, has some of that deeper wiring work to do mm -hmm. and may be very dysregulated in their interactions with us sometimes. Right. So the adverse childhood experiences are 10 research documented experiences that especially when we have them very young, mm -hmm. um, create a, a neural environment that is highly 
reactive emotionally and psychologically, but also is reactive physically. So people with multiple ACEs, adverse mm -hmm. childhood experiences, people with more than four are more likely to have long-term physical debilitating illnesses like diabetes and cancer wow. and autoimmune disorders. Hmm. They impact the, the level of the systems so deeply that they change all the systems. Right. So um, mm -hmm. two kinds of neglect, physical and emotional. Mm -hmm three kinds of abuse, physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, mm -hmm. and then five kinds of family dysfunction, loss of a parent to divorce or death, use of alcohol or drugs by a caregiving parent, abuse of one caregiver by another in your presence as a child, um, a family member involved in crime or who is incarcerated. So somebody like actively dealing drugs or right, um, right. selling stuff off the back of a truck uh, in your household or already in prison for something like that. And then the fifth one is, what have I missed? <laughs> I always miss one. <laughs> I... <laughs> well, and that's why I have the chart on my website. So you can go see Got face it. traces on my website and get all 10 of them. But there's, yeah, there's one more in that family dysfunction. Um, oh, yeah. mental illness. The, uh, a dying, oh, okay, yeah. Like a parent with obsessive compulsive disorder or something other than use of drugs and alcohol that is a mental illness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, uh, you know, I'm glad you said that too, but like, there are some people like you can just very simply change your behavior. Move it. And there's some people like, I, I'm like a pro therapy. I've done therapy for years and years and okay. Decades. Um, and it's so important sometimes. And, and I think too, it's like, you realize again, like, and I don't know, if, you know, you experience this as well. You think you got like, okay, I'm good with that one. Yes. next and then like years go by and all of a sudden like it bubbles back up and like what like i paid so much money to overcome that crap and it's back yes. um and for me like i recently experienced i unfortunately watched my brother pass away like a few years ago and yeah thank you and what i noticed i didn't number one i didn't realize i was traumatized by his death you know, you kind of like right. when things happen in life and you go back to doing what you do and you go to work and you did da, 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 and then all of a sudden something triggers and you're like, whoa, wait a minute, something is not quite right. And I did do EMDR, which was fascinating. Yes. I only did. Yeah. And I read the book, um, The Body Keeps the Score. Yes. Great book, right? Yeah. Sure. And that's how I found out about EMDR found a therapist that happened to be a mile down the road for me that did EMDR. And it is, that's when I really, even though I was kind of already into neuroplasticity at that point, meditation and mindfulness, but then it's fascinating how quickly that worked. Yes. And here it is. I'm like, I was good for a while. Then all of a sudden, bloop, here it comes again. I was like, so even like the fear of abandonment kind of tied into losing my brother, being abandoned, if you will, yeah. by yeah. my brother. And even though it's like death, but it was translated to me psychologically or emotionally or whatever is like a fear of abandonment. And I, I think, um, I think there's, I just think there's like beauty to being so self-aware and then it can also be kind of like, dang it, I wish I wasn't so yes. because you realize it quicker, which is great. Yes. But I've also learned to seek help ASAP. Yes. Like when I realize this is really like hitting me, you know, yeah, there's like a return to the work moment. Oh, time to return to the work. Yes. And I think, you know, the thing that we need to recognize, especially for central nervous systems that were. Uh, traumatized severely. So mm -hmm. I grew up in a family where I was uh, experiencing seven of those 10 ACEs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So from infancy, my brain was wired around fear, uh, lack of safety, feeling like nobody had my back. Right. Um, right. So all of that. So, and, and what we need as infants and toddlers is somebody to be there for us, to help us regulate Mm -hmm. moments of dysregulation in our nervous system. Otherwise they get wired in as like a permanent dysregulation, okay? And so if uh, someone has not been there for me and my brain has gotten wired around a lot of dysregulative patterns, mm -hmm. then what I need to do is consistently start regulating. And so if I'm the co-regulator now, 
Right. I don't have my mom and dad there to be co-regulators with me anymore. So I'm the person who co-regulates. I do the drill. I do the neural drill. I do the EFT tapping. I go in for a session of EMDR. I do the work um, and I will need it again. I will need to do that again because I will have a disruption in my nervous system again. Something yeah. else will trigger me and I will need to do that drill again, do that mm -hmm. tapping again. Right. Yeah, because it's, mm. I was wired, I was dysregulatively wired, uh, dysregulatively. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> okay, my mom was an English teacher. I'm not sure what she would have thought of that word, but let's say it's a word. But I was <laughs> wired around the dysregulative, dysregulated kind of responses for the entire seven years of developing my personality. Do you remember I said we develop 85% of our brain wiring by age three? 95% yeah. of it by age five. Then basically the way I look at it is as, as a developmental observer, what I see is that kids sort of practice that personality for a couple of years, uh -huh. between five and seven, they start applying mm -hmm. the strategies that they have been wired with and right. they turn it into a coherent personality. And then they go out into the world and they live that being until they figure out something else, right? Until something calls their attention to the need for something else. The call to therapy, you know, at 21 or at 31 or at whatever magical age right. you get pulled into that. The change, the big deal in your life changes. Right. You're in a toxic relationship and you get out of it. Right. You're addicted to drugs and alcohol and you get clean and sober. Yep. You, you know, you're in a toxic job mm -hmm. and you get away from the, you know, it's like whatever it is, you address that big deal and you get out of it. And then you can start saying, okay, now. How can I co-regulate with myself? How can I start regulating this fractured nervous system and change? And for some of it, for some people, it's not that hard. It's, you know, some development do-overs, change your patterns of behavior, start noticing your thinking patterns. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, it's continuous work over years, but it's not like the deep into your gut work that really yeah. going into your nervous system can be, can be challenging. Mm -hmm. you're, you're going yeah, deeply into scary. yourself, right? Yeah. I feel like for a lot of people, they, they are kind of scared to like get that deep down because it is, I mean, not going to lie. It can, it can be tough, but gosh, getting to the other side of it is right. Yeah. You know, I, I hear from a lot of people, especially my social media feeds and things like that. Oh, Wendy, you're so happy all the time. I bet you never have a bad day or, uh -huh. oh my gosh, I bet you've had just lived such an easy life. I'm like, uh -huh. oh, like if you only knew <laughs> the amount of work that I have to do or that I have done. I mean, probably like literally since a teenager. Um, and what is it? The, the, I was just thinking like the first book I ever read, I think it was like 13 years old, um, The Codependent No More. Oh my gosh. I remember that. Book. And what, what's funny is like, I, I just found out recently, like that was, I think that was the year, the year that it came out was the year that I have. And it was like the first book I ever read besides, you know, Charlotte's web or whatever, right, right, right. <laughs> whatever well, book that we had to read. But I was always kind of in that. I don't like what I'm feeling. This isn't, this can't be right. So let me, tr let me dig deeper on this and let me, you know, so it is, I mean, I'm glad you said that. Like sometimes, yes, you can overcome some things. Can they be, can they resurface? Yes. Of course. But I think it's like, right. It's like learning those tools that you can, I know, I now have like, not that this is my toolbox, but let's just pretend. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's pretend it I know. Yeah. Let's pretend. I know the tools that work for me. Yes. You know, right. It's like. Yes. Okay, call the therapist, uh, meditate, go for a walk or whatever, you know, I've learned what works for me. And I do know when I get a little like, okay, something's not right. Something right. doesn't feel right. Take a step back. Let's work on that and get back to life, you know? Right. Um, but, so, and, and I think too, it's like, you know, people at midlife, they, they do probably get to midlife. I know I did. It was like, looking at your circle of people, you know, your relationships and going, yes. wait a minute. So, and, and the same thing, it's like, it's being able to like being on autopilot because you were, your brain has been like trained from yeah. day one and then realizing I'm just been acting the same way and, you know, right. 
So, so what are, what are some, what are some of your tools? So um, I was talking a little bit about the development do over around trust and I call that trust who yeah. for what. So we get clear about what it is we actually need because trust is about needing people. And that's where the fear of abandonment arises is when you feel like you need people and they're not there. Right. So let's look at, well, how are they there? Are they there in some ways and not other ways? And what can I do around that? So that's one of my favorites. And it is high impact for people to yeah. take a look at that. It's, it's life transforming to do that development, do over work all the way, like mm -hmm. to, from start to finish to really get into it. Um, is a coaching piece that I love doing with people because it really is, it's quite dramatic how it can change lives. Um, another one that I really love to do with people is the big dream. Um, you know, three-year-olds have so much imagination and so much ability to really literally believe everything, anything, everything. The world is magical to them. They're a long ways away from being logical at three. Mm -hmm. And they've really just started paying attention to the world because they've been really Infants and toddlers are very focused on themselves and their body mm. mechanics. It's yeah. all about getting from being a limp piece of noodle who can't do anything to being a kid who can ride a tricycle and climb trees and run and mm -hmm. talk and all kinds of things they couldn't do in the beginning. Okay, so all of that work is over. And it's like, literally, sometimes I think three-year-olds just like pick up their head one day and look at the rest of the world and go, oh my God, look what I've been missing. This yeah. has been all along too. Yeah. <laughs> and so all of a sudden they're paying attention to everything and none of it makes any sense. Right. Right. So they're bringing in all of this new sensory data and just, it blows up their imagination because they can't understand it as a cause and effect world yet. Mm -hmm. All right. So play imagination and dreams coming up with the most fantastical big dreams that you can imagine three-year-olds are so good at this and they have all these ideas about what they want to be and do right? right and if they hear that that's exciting to the grown-ups around them and that those grown-ups are willing to let them try to be and do mm -hmm. all the things then they come into adulthood with this really healthy sense of play and possibility and dream and those are the people i think who tackle big problems in the world or big long-term issues those are the people that volunteer at the dog shelter and Right. You know, um, uh, become the people who advocate for children in court and, the, you know, the CASAs, mm -hmm. the court reporting special advocates. Those are people who take on a problem that they know they'll work on their whole lives until they're too old to work on it anymore and too tired. And it will have changed, but it will still be there. It won't be gone. They don't have the illusion that they're going to change the world. They're just going to change this one kid's life or this one dog's life today. Mm. And they just keep doing that. Okay. So that kind of commitment to a dream, I call big dreaming, having a big mm. dream. I am going to change the way we treat children in America. Mm. That's mine. Ah. And I do that by helping grownups get better at being grownups. Because yeah. look who influences those first three right. years and wires the brain. It's us grownups. Mm -hmm. So if we're stumbling around out here without any social and emotional intelligence of our own, and we're also being the people who raise the kids to have social and emotional intelligence for when they're adults, right. we've got like this vicious cycle going that I would like oh, to turn yes. into a little more virtuous circle that feeds rather than, than doesn't. So yeah, so that's, that's really what it's all about for me is that big dream. So the big dream activity development do over is to pick something. And we, I go through a beginning process. Each of these things has steps. So I go through a beginning process of saying, what should we change in the world? Mm -hmm. This is in my TEDx talk. I do this in very brief format in my TEDx talk from the stage. What should be different in the world? Say something that you think somebody shouldn't do. Somebody should get all the plastic out of the ocean. Mm -hmm. Your turn. Right. What should somebody do, Wendy? Your turn. Uh, what should somebody do? Um, they should, um, more random acts of kindness, just being kind to one another. People should just be kind. Yeah. Somebody should make sure that people are more kind to other people. Somebody yeah. should stop child abuse. Somebody should make sure that all the dogs are spayed and neutered. I mean, the list could be ample. I mean, we could brainstorm yeah. for days, right? Then I encourage people to feel into the one that is grabbing hold of them. Mm -hmm. Say them out loud instead of somebody should say I should. 
Mm -hmm. and try them on like a shirt in the store. Does this fit me? Am I the person who should end child abuse? Am I the person who should help people be more kind? Am mm -hmm. I the person who should get the plastic out of the ocean? What's that feel like for me? Right. And when you feel the one that sort of grabs a hold of you and tightens your throat and makes tears come to your eyes when you mm -hmm. say, I should do that, that's yeah. the one to do. That's the big dream that's calling to you as you're calling to it. That's the commitment for your life. And it's like, this is the fire that wakes up your life every day. This is it. the energy that makes you want to live is that you're making a difference in this arena all the time, every day. And it feels good. Yeah. I love it. So we work with then a pattern of dreaming that into a reality. What would that look like? If, how would you feel as a person, if that were true in your life, you had done this thing. It had really been accomplished while you were alive. There mm -hmm. is no more child abuse. People are kind everywhere. There's no more plastic in the ocean. The thing is done and you're on the other side of it. How does that feel? How does that, exp how does that body experience? Mm -hmm. How does that make you, uh, how, what are your emotions around that? What are the thoughts you're having? What's the posture you stand with? How do you move when you know that's true? Right. And lo hold that space of being for yourself out there as a possibility and come back to today. And we do this whole back and forth between now and then, you know, kind of like building the bridge between the two. And then we literally go through a process called the map of promise that builds the bridge between the two. So the development do-overs are not, I don't think that you can come to a workshop and do something for 20 minutes right. and change your life. Mm -mm. Development took seven years. I was going to say, wouldn't that be nice if it only took? <laughs> like, give me a little coaching time with you, you know, give yes. me a few months with you. Don't expect to come to a workshop or come to one coaching experience and have it change your life. It's yeah. a taste. It's a beginning. Mm -hmm. But right. then there's, then there's the commitment to the yeah. dream of being a different person, being a person who's better in relationships. Yeah. It's funny. I used to call it, um, the hot tub experience. You know, it's like you, you, you can go to like a little weekend workshop and it feels so good. You first get in, you're like, Oh my God, it feels so good. And then you get back home and you're like, Oh my God, I'm, I'm cold. Give me a towel. Give me like, you know? So yeah, it is in order to like make that really last and make it stick. And it's all, and I love that term of development do over. Oh, thank you. Because, yeah. I love that because it's so true. Like I, I, people that come to me, I'm like, it is possible. Yes. You can recreate, you can recreate a new you, a new life. Like I've, I've done it. Like it, it is exactly. so possible. Yeah. Exactly. It is so possible. And I love, um, I mean, like what you were talking about, like, okay, who do you want to be? And kind of like, all right. And I'm all about like reverse engineering. It's like, even with where I'm at right now, yes. you know, it's like, I had to imagine what I wanted and then, okay, how am I going to get there? How am I going to, how will I be that person? And then just kind of reverse engineer that. Yes. And, that's a lot of what the development do-overs are about. It's sort of like yeah. a, what's, what's the end point that we want? We want right. adults who can get along with each other and right. without, you know, without, erupting into childlike conflict right right or or erasing themselves right or fawning and people pleasing mm -hmm. it's like most of our adult behavior is driven by those four reactions to attack that mm -hmm. we learned when we were toddlers we fight back we freeze in place we fawn over the mm -hmm. other person or we flee we run away we get out of the situation and right. pretty much everything we do is designed around those four strategies and they just don't work for building a community of support for yourself as an adult human being. They mm -hmm. just don't work. So question for you, we were talking about like, um, all right, if, you know, when you think about someone that you can trust or where you feel comfortable, like the, the Roger and the Josephine. Yes. So, so do you, and I actually had a friend of mine um, years and years ago told me this, uh, like, for example, you can't, you, you don't go to Nordstrom's and go buy milk and get mad at Nordstrom's because they don't sell milk. Well, they just don't have milk. You know, they, who knows? They probably do. Not nowadays. their mission. Not their yeah. mission. <laughs> As you notice, I chose Nordstrom's and not Amazon because Amazon. I love, has it. Everything. I love it. But yeah. So do you, you don't go to Nordstrom's for the milk, but do you, so like Roger, would you just 
well, I don't feel safe and comfortable with Roger. Do you end that relationship or do you just oh, manage great that relationship? Question. Yeah. Great question. It depends a little bit on who Roger is to me. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If okay. Roger's the barista at the local Starbucks, man, I can let him go. But okay. yeah. <laughs> but if Roger is my spouse, you know, probably right. not, maybe. And so one of the things that that we do in the sort of tail end of the development do-over around trust is so then how do you teach people to meet your needs? Mm. Who, people who are important to you right. to meet needs that they're not meeting. If you're, and, and sometimes this has to start early because I mean, early in the process, because what we discover is when you list the needs that you realize you have from other people, right. and then you list the person you trust to meet that need, it's all you. Mm -hmm. You meet the need for yourself and you don't lean on anybody. Mm. Or you're leaning on one person all the way down that column, that same person's name is you're trying to get every single need you have in your life met by Roger, your spouse. Uh huh. Right. That's not realistic either. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. What we need to do is say, if you're a person I really care about and you're important in my life and you're not meeting any of my needs, we yeah. need to have a conversation, sweetheart. Maybe we need right. some therapy. We right. need to talk about the fact that I feel abandoned by you because mm -hmm. I have needs that I would like to get met by you that you don't seem to be aware of. It's right. time for you to learn what I need. Right. And let's start with something simple. I need you to listen to me without interrupting. And I'm going to talk until I'm done. Mm -hmm. And then I'll let you know I'm done. And here's how I'm going to let you know I'm done. I'm going to say, okay, I'm complete now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or something like that. Right. <laughs> So what we look at is first, can it, how important is this person? And can I teach them how to meet some needs that are important to me? Some people cannot learn to meet some needs. Let me give you a specific example. I had a, mo a mother who was marvelous in many, many ways. She's passed several years ago now, but she was great at momming in a number of really important ways. But I couldn't see most of them when I was young because the number one thing I needed from her was that I needed for her to uh, praise me, tell me I was doing a good job, give me the support of hearing that I was on the right track and I was a good person and I was handling life. And instead, what I got was criticism over every single freaking thing I did wrong. Because <laughs> what my mom was good at was noticing what was wrong and describing it and pinpointing a way to solve the problem. What my mom was never good at was saying good job in any way, shape, or form. She just wasn't in her skill set. Yeah love her for lots of other things she wasn't able that to give was, me that and sell the milk if i could have when i was 12 sat down with my mom and said mom you are so good at criticizing and correcting i love it that you do that thank god you're there to proofread all my papers before i turn them into my teachers and i really need sometimes for you to pat me on the head and tell me good job and i need to know whether you can do that you know if i could have helped her learn how to do that when i was young it would have changed my world yeah. I don't know that she would have been capable. I've tried to teach her when she was older. It didn't work. Yes. But, yeah. <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, because <laughs> we had more open conversation about things like this as we got older, mm -hmm. when we became more like peers, you know, when your mom is 80 something and you're 60 something, that's a very different dynamic than when your mom is 40 something and you're, you know, 15. Yeah, exactly. Very different. Yeah. And I think even and this is kind of new for me um, in even stating what you need. Number one, knowing what you need. Yes. Right. And then stating what you need. And I had something just not too long ago where I did actually state, hey, you know, I, I need da, 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 da. And then that day I felt so, okay, days after, I should say, I felt so uncomfortable. And I was like, all right, Wendy what is going on? Like, why do you feel so uncomfortable? Why do you have this? And it just all of a sudden it hit me like, Oh, I actually stood up for myself and I asked for that's new to me. I had a need and I, yeah, I, I said it was normal for me to need that. I said it right. was okay. Right. So I validated myself. Yeah. yeah. So I think even that alone Huge. can be something new for people. Yes. Where you like, oh, like standing up for yourself. And, and, and I don't mean that in like a standing up for yourself, right. it's just like, Hey, I need this. I and, need this. and being okay with that to, to, to do that, to know that you can do that in relationship. That it's yeah, a lot like, of, you know, 
Roger's uh -huh. this way, Wendy is this way, and I should be able to get, hey, Roger, could you just let me talk? And then, and then, and I guess it is kind of like seeing how things play out, right? I mean, yes, right? Seeing yeah, Roger. I give, I give you some opportunities to learn the new thing that I want you to do. I tell you, I'm going to yeah. talk now about something important to me. And I want you to just listen. I don't want you to say anything until I say, Mm -hmm. okay, I'm done, or okay, I'm complete, then I would like to hear from you what you think, or then I would like you to just sit with me right. and not say any, I mean, help them literally learn what to do yeah. that will work for you. And I, a big part of the development do over work around trust is just normalizing the fact that we all have needs and that actually as human beings, we all have pretty much the same needs. Mm -hmm. And that for, for me, different ones are sort of backlit. And for you, there are others that are, you know, in the spotlight, there's right. different ways that we respond, but it's like, I give people a tool with 12 categories of normal human needs, find something you need in each one of these 12 categories, because I guarantee you, you need something. Right. Normalizing that being needy is the human condition and, you know, sort of get out of my face with your neediness. BS because yeah, babe, so are you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Whoever you are telling me that I'm needy. Yeah. You too. <laughs> I know it. I've said that too. I'm like, well, we are human beings We're right. human beings being human and right. we have needs. I mean, yeah, exactly. I know we all, yes. We're all doing the best we can on the playground. <laughs> That's right. That is right. Oh my gosh. This has been so, so great. I, I even told you before we had started that I love this topic of relationship because it is, like you said, what did you say that it, it is everything, right? It is. It's not the only, it's everything. It, it yeah. ties into so much of our lives. Yes. Yes. And we are absolutely not stuck with whatever we grew up with yes, to define how we get, we really can reprogram ourselves, rewire ourselves, remake how we do relationships. If it's not working, if you're the person that everybody tries to stay away from at the party, you know, you can change that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. So tell us how we can find you. All right. So let me tell you how you can change that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is L. Carol Scott. So lcarolscott.com is my website. And I would like to send everyone a little book at, I call it. It's 28 pages, cover to cover. It's a cute little book, um, tiny and very to the point. It's called Become Your Sassy Self. Your self-aware success strategies make you sassy. So um, this is a PDF. If you send me an email at carol at lcarolscott.com, I will send you back my little book at. Just put the name of either Wendy's show or Wendy. Uh, put the something in the subject line to let me know where you heard about it and I'll shoot that back to you and more information on the website I want to encourage people to come to my Sunday salon Ooh. a month on Sunday the second Sunday of every month I do a free 90 minute coaching experience and you can oh. sign up I keep it small so the seats are by reservation um, just no more than 10 people and you get a, a little sip of sass for me a little taste of the coaching work that I do I love it. Oh my gosh. It's this great fun. It's great yeah. fun. It's a different group each time. And we just talk about our relationships and what's going on. And I bring the development do over work. It's really, it's been oh, awesome. Oh my gosh. I'm, I've got to go on there. <laughs> oh yeah. Come join us. Come join us. I'd be a good little guinea pig. That's for sure. There you go. Oh my God. And I did read the book, the book at, which I love that term. Oh, thank you. Um, and it's so good. I mean, just that alone. Yeah. It's just, even just, I, I would, I love, I've always loved learning about human beings and myself. Yeah. And I always encourage everyone to do that because you learn about yourself. It improves your relationships and improves your whole life. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, the more, the more knowledge and the more wisdom that we can absorb as adults consciously, the better. Yeah. Right? And yeah. there there, Wendy Valentine goes, getting on the list of people who meet my need for being told good job. Yeah. <laughs> good job, Carol. Thank you. Thank <laughs> You're you very awesome. Much. You truly are. And I'm so grateful that you did all the work. 
on yourself yes to be able to bring your most authentic most beautiful self forward so that other people can Thank learn you, you know Thank you for saying that Thank yeah you. i know because i uh, yeah again like i know how much hard work it is Yes, but it's so worth it to get to the it's other my life. It's my big dream. It's my life mission. Yeah. It makes it makes it worth it. Thank you for having me to talk with your audience. I'm just really excited to have met you. All right. Thank you so much. And I can't wait. Uh, can't wait for a second Sunday. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Wendy. All right. Bye. Bye.